like he used to dare me to run around the garden naked um, when I was young. And like him and my mum would just laugh and it would be dark, but you know, we had, it was a, you know, a semi-detached, you know, and I look back and I, I always thought that was normal. I thought it was banter or whatever. And it was only until the last year I told someone, they looked at me and was like, he did That's what? That's not right. Yeah. And, mm. and even now, I spoke to my sister about a couple of weeks ago and she still doesn't really see anything wrong with it because that's what we grew up with. And there was another time where my stepdad paid my sister £10 to lick the dead flies off his motorbike. Wow, that's yeah. that's pretty disturbing. <laughs> you know, like the front of the motorbike, you know, all the guts. The grill. The... Yeah. Yeah. And... I remember he tried to get me to do it and I was like, no, that's, that's the line I won't cross. Um, no. But I mean, how old were you at, at this point in your life? Five or six. Just literally, she. there's a photo I have on my Instagram. Um, and I was, I was looking through my photos the other day and she's like, you know, stood that there's, I've got a photo of her and she's there with a tissue like that on her arm. And I look at it and it's like, she's so blasé about the fact that that's because she's bleeding from her inject in, um, you know, and she's, she didn't try and hide it. Um, it wasn't like she, she'd shoot up in front of me um, at all, and I want to make that clear, but she also didn't hide, you know, she, she did methadone as well as heroin, so there'd be the little green bottles in our bathroom bin and so forth, um, and they'd, they got better at hiding it, but at first, you know, I'd just go into their bedroom and you'd open the drawer and there'd be the burnt spoons and the needles. And I always knew there was something wrong with our spoons because they, they always said they were tea stained, but they weren't, you know, they, they were really burnt. I, I can't even tell you what they looked like. They just almost like really rusty, horrible spoons and every one of our spoons were like it. And I'm still really funny about spoons now. Um, and my mum used to always say to me, I'd never share my spoons, you know, I'd never burn them and then put them back in for you guys to eat. And she's only recently admitted to me that she did. You know, so I'd sit there and eat my cereal in the morning <laughs> with hair and burnt spoons, you know? Um, and I remember I used to wash them, and especially when I got a bit older, um, like if I ever did have friends around, which was very rare, I used to scrub them so hard and I was so embarrassed of them and they just felt so disgusting. And Hello and welcome to my first solo interview for the Sean Atwood True Crime channel. And today I have uh, quite a harrowing story for you guys. We have Penelope here who we have pixelated for her own anonymity. And today's story is about heroin addictions, abusive relationships, and mental health. So to start, Penelope, if you wouldn't mind giving people your backstory, uh, starting from where you grew up, and we can move forward. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Um, Jen, I'm really looking forward to, you know, sharing my story. Um, so yeah, as um, Jen said, I'm Penelope Red. Um, so I am in my mid twenties um, and I have um, a full-time job and this is something sort of um, I've started doing recently, but we'll go on to that later. So sort of my background isn't a um, usual one, I would say that we all expect from um, heroin addicts and so forth. Um, so starting right at the beginning, um, I was born to my mother and father who were married and I have also have an older sister. We grew up um, in a small village um, about an hour away from London and everything you know seemed nice. They had a mortgage and so forth um, but prior to my birth there were a few issues that weren't resolved from their childhoods um, which I think sort of led on to um, you know what become my story. Um, and I think this is something that I really find difficult when telling my story is when does somebody else's story become your own? Um, and I think what I mean by this is what my mum's been through as a child. Obviously, that's her story to tell. However, because she didn't deal with it, 
it's now become my story too. Um, and it's almost like you don't want to share other people's secrets, but they sort of use it. And then, you know, my mum always told me her secrets. And from that, you know, they, they've almost become mine. I wear them sleeves. Um, and I find it really difficult, you know, that balance of should I say, should I not say? Because um, ultimately it, it didn't happen to me. Um, but I still feel the repercussions of it. Um, so my mum grew up in an okay, um, you know, situation. There, her mum and dad were together. I think her mum was um, on Valium. I think that was quite a big thing back then. It's sort of like a sleeping tablet. Um, yeah. And, you know, it wasn't like they were poor or anything. I think my mum had a horse at some point um, and they grew up in the countryside. Yeah, quite nice. Um, I think my mum didn't get a lot of attention. Um, and she moved to London when she was 16, um, which I, I can't actually imagine moving to London at 16 on my own. I think she didn't even wave her off, you know, it was like, goodbye. And, and she got married um, and that man then turned out to be gay. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I can't imagine how that was. And then she got into the wrong crowd and, um, fell into heroin at the age of 16. So she actually had done it before I was born. Um, yeah, and lived in London for a couple of years. She even, um, well, this is what she says anyway, you can't always trust a heroin addict, but um, apparently she had a flat in Kensington and dated this really rich, um, um, Arab, um, rich foreign man. Um, and he brought her a Rolex and everything and then her house got raided by a heroin addict friends because, you know, they'll sell anything for drugs. Um, and then one of her closest friends died. And that's when she moved back to the small town and then started the relationship with my dad. So obviously my dad knew that she had been a heroin addict, but she'd gotten over it. And it's quite hard to get over heroin addiction. Um, so the fact that she, you know, she come out with it once. I think my dad probably thought that was the end of it. Um, and your dad wasn't an addict at all? No. So I would say my dad um, is a bit of an alcoholic. Um, we always make jokes to him about it, but I'm sort of not joking when I say it. So every birthday, every Christmas, we'll just get him bottles of red wine. He's even got a red wine subscription. Um, and, you know, when, when he was younger, um, I didn't really like my stepmom. So like when he would um, get really drunk and go mental at her, I'd be like his little cheerleader, like, go, go, dad. But actually that that's not good. You know, he would be really horrible when drunk. Um, and his sort of his background, um, he had a dysfunctional family too. Um, his dad wasn't really there. And he died when my dad was 18 from a heart attack. He was like, found like two weeks later in a house that he was working on. Um, he was only like 40 something, he was very young. Um, and he was really horrible to my dad's two younger brothers. Um, he sort of seemed to like my dad, but not the other two. And they don't really remember him either. Um, my nan had affairs as well. And my nan is the most toxic woman you'll ever meet, but I love her. Have you ever watched Catherine Tate's, um, you know, the nan that is just so horrible, but funny? I'm trying to think what one that is. Yeah, I think you I know, have. She's sort of, um, it's, it's, a movie has just come out of it, actually. You can watch it on Sky Cinema. And she, her grandson always goes around and she'll be, like, really nice to someone. She'll be like, oh, that's lovely. And then she'll turn around and, like, bitch about them. That's sort of my nan. So when my mum first went round to my dad's she served my mum food in a dog bowl <laughs> well yeah that that's when people ask me to describe my nan that's the only thing I can say really to be honest yeah was she, that a reoccurring theme she served guests food in a dog bowl um, I mean you, you'd be lucky if she served you food um to be honest I, I think my mum asked for sugar in her tea once and she's like what do you think this is you know um yeah the rich yeah she's nuts um so so when my dad was younger my, my nan has quite an issue with keeping hold of stuff so they grew up like um 
in a city and then they moved to a small town and um my nan used to just sell all their stuff so they were never rich i think my nan was even um caught shoplifting once you know they're very poor um and she's her house is still like it now if you go around there's like two bits of furniture in there it's, it's like nobody lives there um and the boys like my dad sort of told me when he was younger they'd be um you know one day they'd go home they'd have a sofa and a bed the next day it'd be gone and they literally just didn't know why and they just play football in an empty room and they didn't really have any boundaries or anything um and i think some of my um you know my dad went through a lot and he had to be like the man of the house and there's some more secrets around my dad but you know again i don't really think it's my place to say um but my dad did have a troubled upbringing too um so he sort of was more of a drinker um but when him and my mum then met and this is what surprises me to be honest from from my dad's perspective they did a lot of party drugs together so you know the likes of speed um mdma all of that they do that quite often you know they were massive drinkers um and i think they're both almost damaged goods in the nicest possible way so they just go out and get absolutely you know off their face with whatever they could not heroin of course my dad wouldn't touch that um so you know their relationship was very on party going out having fun and then they got married and had us kids and i think that's sort of where the equilibrium sort of broke broke up to be honest um so i have an older sister who's two years older than me um she was born and then two years later they decided to have another one and um then i come along and then my mum decided um and, and i think this is a sign of self-sabotage to be honest i've been doing a lot of research on it um mm. and i don't know if it's that my mum she finally had the house the husband and the two kids and I don't think my dad was perfect either I don't think you know I think he still went out and drank quite a lot and left my mum to you know see to the kids she did say at one point they didn't even see each other they were doing shifts and it was like she'd be out at night and then he'd be out in the day and they you know they're almost like lodgers just babysitting and working that was it so my mum I started having an affair with this man um called John um and John was a lovely man but he was known as a local heroin addict um you can google his name and um yeah you'll you'll find all stories about him um he was in and out of jail for petty crime shoplifting so forth to fund his heroin addict um and him he was actually a really lovely person and he had a really nice family unit. So we used to go to his mum and dad's quite a lot and they lived in this really nice big house and they were so lovely. And, uh, you know, he had a brother and his brother was normal as such. And I don't know what quite happened to John, but, you know, he, he had his demons sort of like my mum and he couldn't get away from them. Um, so my dad insists he doesn't know, but obviously the fact that my mum was dating this man, obviously, he i think maybe he chose not to read into it and he fell into a bit of depression obviously your wife cheating on you and you moving out of the house you'd loved and you know he he actually had a little bit of a problem with cocaine for a while um he did come out with the other end and i wouldn't say it was anywhere near as serious you know i never saw anything i think there was only once when my mum went to drop us at my dad's and he was out because i think he had a friend that he used to just go and get coped up with so we went to my nan's instead because my nan for all of her you know issues she was like a mum and dad to us at times um so sort of what she did wrong as a mum I'd say she made up for as a grandmother um she was she's been really good you know um to us it, I, I can't thank her enough um so yeah so obviously we lived in the house um that my dad and my mum owned and my dad had obviously moved out and John would come around and I think that they decided to sell the house for whatever reason um I don't know what happened with that money to be completely honest with you I think you can take a wild guess um but we moved into a rented house 
and I, I don't really remember a lot, but I remember that was when things started to feel weird. I remember the first day of moving in, my mum just crying in the kitchen. It was like a new build. Um, and she was crying because, you know, her and John had just broke up because he wouldn't stop the drugs. You know, and I was aware of all of that. Um, How old were you at this point? I was probably about three, if that. I just, I just have, a, I remember the house and I really remember my mum just absolutely being dead. Like my sister and I were so excited about being in this because uh, how the house was set up, it was a two bed, but both rooms had an en suite. So me and my sister shared a room, but we shared a bathroom too. And my mum had her own bathroom and it, we felt like we'd won the lottery or something. We were like, wow, we got an en suite. Um, and my mum was just so sad for ages when we were there. Um, I don't know if he was in prison at this time. Um, I do remember when I was younger, and apparently it's like this in America, and you you might know with your crime <laughs> podcast, I, I used to think when I was younger, it'd be like three strikes and you're out. So if you got sent to jail three times, that was it, you're locked up forever. And I remember when he got arrested for the third time, I was crying my eyes out as a child, like, we're never going to see him again, you know, really sad. And obviously it doesn't work like that. <laughs> that would be a good theory, but... <laughs> I love how, how as a child, I, I constructed that, though. I sort of thought that they had three strikes and you're out. We used to live really close to the police station as well. Um, and, and what makes this all quite funny, if you, or maybe ironic, is my mum was actually, um, she worked in social services, so she'd be the person that would come into your house and, you know, tell you that you're disgusting for letting your dog poop on the floor and, you know, would call, yeah, call child services because, um, you know, you're not looking after your kids. Um, and she did actually tell me a story about um, when she was working um, at one place uh, for a council, she, um, my that John, my mum's lover, um, he had spray painted her name on the back of the building, like X is a slag or something like that, like real, really childish. And there was another person at work, I think, who worked in the call centre with the same name. So they thought it was about them. And my mum knew, but she didn't say anything. Because obviously if she was linked at work with this man, they'd know that she was involved mm -hmm. in drugs. Um, so she kept on that secret. So this poor woman, probably to this day, thinks that she got spray painted her pal. <laughs> it wasn't her. It was actually my mum. But my mum just sat on it. Um, <laughs> poor woman. Christ. I know. <laughs> um, it, so it was quite turbulent, obviously. Um, my dad, we'd, we'd see him quite often. And we actually did. My, my dad booked us a holiday to Spain when we were really young. And it was me, my sister, my mum and my dad. And it was the best holiday ever. Uh, uh, they went together and I knew that, you know, they had two separate hotel rooms. And my mum was really fun on it. I think that might have been when John was in prison. So there was a, you know, she must have got away for maybe six months or something but it, it was just so like she become really good friends with you know when you go to um like all inclusive hotels they have like kids club she become really good friends with the two women who did it um and they went out drinking my mom even broke her toe on a night out and because my mum become friends with them they'd let me and my sister like run the club I remember if you come out of the pool you weren't allowed in the room until you dried off but I didn't have to because my mum was friends with them I just walk in all wet and I remember this other kid coming straight after me and they got like told off and we got such special treatment I remember at the time I felt you know it was great um and I still have pictures from that holiday and it was really good my mum looks back on it a bit differently you know she said that my dad would just get drunk and the nights that he was meant to be looking after us he he, he didn't um but you know I don't remember that I just remember a really good holiday I, I even got proposed to by a little boy with a Harry Bow ring <laughs> oh sweet <laughs> did you say yes no <laughs> I did not say yes um I said no I, I, I was obviously a strong person even then I, th I think he, you know we, yeah I should have said yes really just to 
please. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm sure he's not heartbroken over it now. I'm sure no. he's very no. um, I So after that holiday, we come back. And I think my mum started seeing John again. Um, and he was living at a halfway house, um, which I'm sure you saw. Sort of, are you aware of sort of what a halfway house is? Yes, yes. Um, between it's what you go to when you're released from prison. Yeah, yeah. so um, there was one where we lived, and I still remember it was on, on a big hill, and we turn off. And obviously, it's not a place for kids, and women aren't allowed in there, probably because there's sex offenders. There's probably all sorts there. Mm -hmm. um, and my mum used to let me drive the car on, it was like a private car park, and I'd sit on her lap, and she'd do the you know, your accelerator brake and clutch, ABCs. And I just stare. And I remember it being so fun. Because we, we'd be sat in that car park waiting for hours for him. Um, and it wasn't a place to take kids. And I remember once um, I really needed a wee, which we'll go on to, um, <laughs> you know. Um, and my mum was like, oh, well, you know, we'll go in here. And the receptionist was really cold to my mum, you know, but, you can imagine she's probably thinking what the hell are you doing here with two kids um and my mum you know was calling her a bitch and everything she wouldn't let me use the toilet um which quite rightly in the end she did let me use the toilet and I remember it was there was only like rhinos absolutely disgusting um yeah it was very very mm -hmm. odd um I don't know what toilet she used um but she definitely didn't let me use that one um yeah, so I, I remember like getting back in the car. My mum was like, "What a horrible woman!" I remember being sat at the time like, "She's just doing her job. She she knows that we're not supposed to be there." Like she did say, I think she even said to my mum, "What are you doing, bringing your kids in here?" You know, because like I said, there was probably sex offenders and everything in there, or you know, uh, um, so it wasn't a place to take kids. Um, and my dad knew all of this. And I think he does play a little bit of ignorance, um, which, you know, I can't let him do. But the signs were there. Um, so this sort of, my mum, this guy, um, he actually was really nice to us. He had a really kind heart. Um, I just think he had his demons, like I previously said. I remember, like, him barfing us and stuff and, like, just having lots of fun with him. Um but once I got a Game Boy for Christmas and my mum couldn't find it. And she rang my dad. And this is what it was like. She was like, oh, John stole, you know, Penelope's Game Boy and sold it for drugs. Because that's what, that's immediately what, what you go to. And I think my dad probably wanted to beat him up anyway because he stole his life almost. Um, and my dad and his friend went all around the local town looking for him and he said to me he finally gave up he couldn't find him anywhere and he walked into his favorite pub at the end to go for a drink and just give up give up you know and there John was sat there and my dad absolutely beat the crap out of him which really breaks my heart because John is a nice guy um <laughs> and then my mum rings my dad and says oh I found the game boy <laughs> Oh. yeah um so he just got the uh, my dad still feels really bad about it but i'm sure there's a part of him that doesn't regret it because you know this man did steal his wife so um i do i think about his little face though just getting absolutely because he wasn't a violent man you know some drug addicts are but he wasn't he was just you know just such a sweet man um and my mum even says this day like she was his true love um and she still stands by that, you know, if he could have sorted out his demon, she would still be with him now. Um, and I don't remember this, but I did, um, my sister does, and I did go up to my dad when I was about four and I said, Daddy, why has John got a needle in his arm? And apparently, like my dad said, he did ring my mum and have a go at her and my mum is quite a convincing liar and he'd convinced her that I was just a child and making up stories or something. Um, so my dad didn't pursue, you know, anything. Um, so we'd go to my dad's every other weekend. I think my mum had finally had enough of the whole um, him being in and out of jail. So she met 
my stepdad, um, Neil, who um, lived sort of in another, a, a bigger town about 40 minutes away. Um, and he actually knew my uncle. Um, so my uncle's a bit of a stoner. So he sort of, you know, he, he knows all the local heroin addicts and so forth. He even knew my mum's dealer, um, who's now dead because, you know, he overdosed like most heroin addicts do. Um, and, you know, when my mum first started seeing him, my uncle was like to me, this guy's dodgy, you know? I was like, great. <laughs> you know, I was only young as well. Um, but he seemed really nice. I still remember him kind of coming in the house and I was there in a princess dress, like poking me and my sister were like pushing each other down, like who would go and meet him first. And he was really, really nice at first. Um, like he, he had a really nice car. He still lived at home, even in his thirties um, with his mum, but like he really put up himself. He had a sort of designer or, or like high end, high street clothes on um, and a nice car. And they started dating and everything was going well at first and then they sold that house uh, and then we went on a family holiday to Florida with some of my mum's friends which was absolutely amazing uh, you know I'm really lucky to have had that experience um, I think my dad did pay some towards it as well um, my mum blew quite a lot of money on that and I'm really grateful for that because I know I think when you think about addicts and so forth, you don't think, you know, a lot of them don't get to go on holidays and so forth. Um, so, yeah, I, I was really lucky in that respect. And that's maybe why I haven't told my story before, because I feel, you know, I have had privileges as well. Um, so when we went to Florida, it was amazing. I even slept in my mum and stepdad's bed. You know, he was really good with us. Um, and then it just seemed to be when we come back and we moved away we moved to where his hometown was so 40 minutes away from my dad that was where everything just changed for the worse. um so sort of the memories I have of that house I remember um my mum always worked full time and so did my stepdad um so I always went to after school clubs and stuff and I, I used to you know think my mum was a hero you know working full time and then when she'd be really lethargic and passed out um, when I got home, I'd I'd put it down to her, you know, being a full time mum and being a full time worker. But actually, it wasn't that. You know, she actually was just off her face. Um, and one time when I come home from dance after school class, I remember hearing my stepdad. And this is the first time I've heard this side of him. He picked me up, and when he got home, he was on the phone and he was saying, "I'm going to hammer you. I'm going to absolutely kill you." And I was like. Who, who's he talking to and I later found out it was to um you know my mum's old lover and you know he bumped into my mum and tried to you know get her back or whatever um so he was threatening him um and it was really scary to hear that side of him because I thought he was just this really nice guy and and then I learned that he we had this photo up of him in the army um as you come in through the door and I learned that he actually got kicked out of the army for drugs. Oh, um, yeah, I, I was listening to this podcast once and they said, never trust anyone who gets kicked out of the army. And I still think that's true. Um, yeah, so um, he was, they told me it's for weed, um, but I think it's probably a bit more serious than that, to be honest. Mm. Maybe speed or something like that. But, you know, I don't have all the facts. Um so as I was learning more about him, I was a bit like, ooh, this guy's a bit dodgy. But, you know. Um, and then he started making my sister and I do dares. Um, and I, I'm i really lucky to say that I was never sexually assaulted. And I know a lot of people were. And I, I am really grateful for that. And I wouldn't like to, you know, put my stepdad in that bracket because he didn't do that. Um, but he did um, do other dares. Like he used to dare me to run around the garden naked um, when I was young. And like him and my mum would just laugh and it would be dark. But, you know, we had, it was a, 
you know, a semi-detached, you know, and I look back and I, I always thought that was normal. I thought it was banter or whatever. And it was only till the last year I told someone, they looked at me and was like, he did That's what? That's not right. Yeah. And, mm. and even now, so I spoke to my sister about a couple of weeks ago and she still doesn't really see anything wrong with it because that's what we grew up with. And there was another time where my stepdad paid my sister £10 to lick the dead flies off his motorbike. Wow, that's yeah. that's pretty disturbing. <laughs> you know, like the front of the motorbike, you know, all the guts. The grill. The... Yeah. Yeah. And I remember he tried to get me to do it, and I was like, no, that's not the line I won't cross. Um, no. But I mean, how old were you at, at this point in your life? Five or six. That's so young. Yeah. Um, we would have been in year three when we lived there. I don't really know what that correspond. Maybe seven. Um, so, yeah, still very young. Um, so I would have been in year three. My sister would have been in year five. Um, so by that point, I'd already lived in like three different houses with different men. Um, and then we moved again. Um, so where we where we moved to at first when we sort of by my stepdad's hometown but not fully in it so we were still quite uh, still a little bit closer to my dad but then we moved further into the town and that is really when the addiction got worse and there were the signs and they just stopped giving a crap really um so you know they'd my mum would walk around with a bloody tissue on her um, hand here and her and I struggled quite bad with eczema. So I always thought that she just scratched until she bled. But now obviously I know that's not the case. And just literally, she there's a photo I have on my Instagram. Um, and I was, I was looking through my photos the other day and she's like, you know, stood that there's, I've got a photo of her and she's there with a tissue like that on her arm. And I look at it and it's like, she's so blasé about the fact that that's because she's bleeding from her injecting, um, you know, and she's, she didn't try and hide it. Um, it wasn't like she, she'd shoot up in front of me um, at all, and I want to make that clear. But she also didn't hide, you know, she, she did methadone as well as heroin. So there'd be the little green bottles in our bathroom bin and so forth. Um, and they'd, they got better at hiding it. But at first, you know, I'd just go into their bedroom and you'd open the drawer and there'd be the burnt spoons and the needles. And I always knew there was something wrong with our spoons because they, they always said they were tea stained, but they weren't, you know. They they were really burnt. I, mm. I can't even tell you what they looked like. They just almost like really rusty, horrible spoons and every one of our spoons were like it. And I'm still really funny about spoons now. Um, and my mum used to always say to me, I'd never share my spoons, you know, I'd never burn them and then put them back in for you guys to eat. And she's only recently admitted to me that she did. You know, so I'd sit there and eat my cereal in the morning <laughs> with hair and burnt spoons, you know? Um, and I remember I used to wash them, and especially when I got a bit older, um, like if I ever did have friends around, which was very rare, I used to scrub them so hard and I was so embarrassed of them and they just felt so disgusting and I just can't believe she did that to us you know we we didn't have a lot of food anyway so you know if there was cereal in the house that was great heroin addicts don't really eat that much um they sort of graze so like my mum loved Twixes so she'd have a Twix in the fridge at all times or and we couldn't eat it, you know, that was just my mum. You know, I guess, I don't know if you get the munchies sort of like you do with wheat, but she sort of almost had that, you know, at one point she just needed Twix and that was like an addiction to her almost. Um, and the only other food that would be in the fridge is like Cadbury mini rolls that I cannot stand now. And like, really? yeah, there was no like food. Yeah. I, the only thing my mum did do, she did do a roast on a Sunday. She was always brought up that way, so she continued to do that. So, you know, I did get fed on a Sunday. <laughs> I was um, going to ask how she maintained the household during her addiction. Yeah, so um, so this is where the sort of stereotypes and so forth don't really fit. So my mum 
um, and it, she did maintain the house in terms of, you know, it would be clean and tidy um, and everything. How I describe it is it's not how it feels, it's how it looks. And that's what it was like for us as well. It doesn't matter how I feel, it matters how I look. And my mum would like clean our clothes, you know, but that was it, you know, it, everything was just almost to tick a box. Um, but like the bathroom, she wouldn't deep clean it. You know, there were still blood stains on the floor and her bedroom, she had where she'd obviously injected one. So there was a massive blood stain all up the wall. And she tried to move the bed to hide it. And she tried to tell me it was tea and it, you know, it wasn't. Um, and she, she wasn't really good at interiors, bless her. So, you know, we never like had any, well, when we moved into the house, that's how it looked all the way through. You know, we didn't get new carpets or anything um, or like really redecorated. We never had a working shower, we had a bath. Um, my stepdad was a builder, but he didn't do anything because he was just too lazy. Um, so yeah, my mum basically just did the washing, washing up and a tiny bit of cooking, but she wouldn't go out shopping or anything she just popped to tesco's the local tesco's you know when she was getting her cigarettes and then would pick up some chocolates or milk because they're massive tea drinkers which i am too um and basically their evenings consisted of and weekends um is they had a sofa each in the living room and they'd just be absolutely passed out on them um and then they'd get up go and have a cigarette then they'd have these like 10 minute mood swings and my mum would like grab me and swing me around and be really excited and then she'd hug me and then I'd hug her back and then she'd be like can you get off me it just like just like that she'd switch um and I always knew that was weird like I once text my so my mum used to be really good friends with my um my cousin's mum so that's my my brother my dad's brother's ex-wife um and I actually got my mum's phone once and texted her I call her my auntie and said do you want to meet up because I knew it wasn't right that my mum my mum didn't drop me at the school gate she didn't like speak to any other mums she didn't have any friends like I knew it was weird I just like I wasn't like other kids I didn't go on play dates or um have people round or my mum wouldn't meet people for coffee um she wouldn't come to like school plays or anything like sports day she always put it down to work but it wasn't, it was, you know, because she didn't want to. Um, and like on weekends, I'd be like to my friends, oh, you know, do you want to meet up or something or go and knock for them? They'd be like, oh, I'm going to London for the day or, you know, I'm going out with my mum. I've never, when I was younger, I never went out for a day with my mum. Her weekends would just pass out on that sofa and me and my sister would just be left to our own devices. Um, outside, out of mind, you know, the, the, the quieter we were, the better um and it sort of ca continued like that um and then when we were also in this house I was sort of getting to my you know nine ten eleven that sort of age and that sort of when um my stepdad was getting more physical with us um like pushing us and um he used to poke us and that sounds really trivial but a grown man poking you with all of his force I can't tell you how much it hurts. And he used to do it in my chest area or here. And he used to strangle me and my sister quite a lot. I know my sister said there was a time once, I don't remember this, I must have blocked it out, but she come down once and he was strangling me so much. I was, you know, purple. And she still says this day, if she didn't grab him off and beg him to but I put it today, you know, she really stands by that. Um, and she's quite traumatized by that. Like she doesn't talk about it now, but um, I remember like they used to argue as well. My mum and stepdad really bad and she'd have all bruises and then they'd go out in the car for hours and then they'd come back and, oh, it was just all so weird. They would, it was such a weird setup. Um, and I, I was still quite young then, still quite naive. Um, and then it sort of got really bad when I hit secondary school to to be honest that was when you know I was learning more about the world I was learning about myself um I knew I was different and I didn't know why um I actually 
I actually had a friend whose mum was a heroin addict, um, you know, like a, a stereotypical one, let's say, um, and she got taken into care. And I remember my mum slacking off her mum, saying how gross she was, because I, I remember going around her house once and we found like mouldy chocolate cake under a bed, like that wouldn't happen at my house. Like my mum would have, wouldn't have, well, she wouldn't have brought chocolate cake in the first place, but you know, she, she, she was quite tidy with stuff like that. Um, and our house was just, you know, typically gross and stunk and yeah. Um, and my mum is really judgmental and she made me almost judgmental. And we had a non-pyjama day at school um, and my friend come round, whose mum was a heroin addict. And before she got taken into care, my mum went to Asda and got me some new pyjamas because I didn't have any. And um and my friend asked my mum if she'd get her some too, because she didn't have any. And my mum said no. Which I can't believe she said no. I, I get it, but I just feel really sorry for her. And I always, because of what my mum said, I always put myself like I, I, I wasn't in that bracket. But actually a lot of what she experienced, I experienced too. Um, and I her mum was just open about it and every you know people at school knew what she was about and what her parents were and they you know they were more sympathetic and they tried to help um so sort of as I got older um you know I I, I was angry at the world I knew about you know I knew something was up with my mum and I I used to come home from school and I'd look through her drawers trying to find it because she'd tell me that she wasn't on it or that she'd... I, I was going to ask, at what age did you start to recognise your mum's addiction? Because obviously yeah. she covered it quite well. Yeah. When did you know for sure? So it was probably, I was about 12 or 13. Um, and my sister or had already knew, because um, I remember I went to her and I went, I found needles and stuff. And obviously you don't automatically think of heroin when you, like as, as a kid, you probably do when you're older. But for me, I was like, what the hell is all this? You know, why have they got this? Um, and I went to my sister first. I was like, I found that she was like, she was probably like 15. She was like, duh. Like, you know, um, yeah, they've been heroin addicts all of our life. And I was be like, no, you know, they have their issues, but no. And I, I confronted my mum about because that's the type of person I am. I'm not, you know, my sister would sit on the information and do nothing. Um, so I went up to my mum and I was like, mum, what the hell is this? She's like, oh, I've never seen that before. <laughs> and I believed her. I was like, what? So he's doing this behind your back. And she's like, oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, mum, I feel so sorry for you. Like, she's so manipulative. So she said that he was going to get in a way. And then I continued to find it and I went like, you know, you're lying. You know, when I spoke to my nan about it and she was like, yeah, we, we, we all know that your mum's a heroin addict. I was like, oh, well, great. <laughs> Thanks, guys. You know, talk of the town. But nobody feels like telling us. Um, and that's when I just got really angry at the world. And I started... Um, because my mum and stepdad worked full time, the only time I got the house myself was like after school, so between three and five. And I'd watch, you know, like Comedy Central and one of my favourite programmes, Two and a Half Men. Um, oh, I used to love that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Charlie Sheen was in it. Um, and I got obsessed with Charlie Sheen, like his, his heartless way. I was like, I want to be like him. I want to screw people over. And he has a quote, um, which I lived by in my teens, <laughs> which well, I, it was literally like my mantra. And it was the best way to not get your heart broken was pretend you don't have one. And I did that. Like, really, I, I wouldn't look at my mum in the eye. I literally just shut myself off from my family. Um, and I started like, you know, smoking weed, smoking. Um, I did a few party drugs when I got to like 15, like a bit of coke. And I started hanging out with drug dealers and they they wouldn't even talk about heroin. And that's when I knew that it was so messed up that I couldn't talk about it. You know, they, they talk about everything else, but heroin was such a taboo. And I started to get in trouble at school 
because I wasn't getting any attention at home. I wasn't getting any attention anywhere else. And the other way to get attention was to be naughty. And one of the teachers once turned around and said to me, you know, you act like you've been raised by wolves. And I <laughs> if I had a child and they come home and said that to me, I'd go and go mental at that child. However, when I told my mum, she laughed. She knew. She knew she, she knew I was, you know. She was the wolf. <laughs> um, you know, my mum just didn't care. Like food tech classes, I wouldn't ever have anything. And everybody just thought it was me being lazy. Like I couldn't be bothered to tell my mum on school trips. I was the only one who didn't go on it. Um, it's because my mum wouldn't give me the money because she didn't have any. You know, all of the wages went on heroin. You know, they earned you know, they had a mortgage, they had an all right house, but I didn't get any new clothes or anything. Everything, you know, all the money went on it. And so when I got older, uh, still like in 15, say, I'd come home from school and then I'd go out with my friends and I'd get like a call from one of my neighbours, like, oh, the ambulance is here again. I'd be like, oh, okay. And then I'd go home and my mum would say that my stepdad would have had an asthma attack and the ambulance would be there. Um, but now I actually know it was overdoses. Um, so not a lot of people know this, but a heroin overdose is actually reversible. Um, yeah, not a lot of people know this. How so? They, uh, so they have like a drug almost, almost like a... So what they do, they heroin addicts go mental when you do it to them though because it takes away their high. So my stepdad used to get up and want to fight the ambulance people. <laughs> yeah, so he'd like generally <laughs> beat, beat them up um, and they just want to get out of there. So I think it's a drug called Nax, Naxalapine, something like that, or Naxaline, because um, I didn't know about it either. And I couldn't believe it either. So recently I was told that I would qualify to go and get one from the pharmacy assist like as a daughter of a heroin addict like because obviously now I can't get taken into care now that I'm older and I was like I don't know if I want to bear that responsibility like obviously I want to save my mum's life but I don't see her enough and like to have that responsibility of carrying this it's almost like an EpiPen you know that you then put in um and yeah it re reverses it um yeah a lot of homeless shelters and so forth have them um so you know that would quite have often happen my stepdad and when when you use heroin basically you get a drop and they'd literally physically drop so i'd hear like a thud in the next door room and i'd know what it was and they'd say that they went had migraines to go in their room for hours and When we wake up in the morning, we get out of bed and we start our day with Koro Snacks. Koro is a healthy snacks brand focusing on bringing additive-free natural ingredients to their customers with fair prices in bulk packaging. They have everything from nut butters to free from baking ingredients to cooking essentials and of course the snacks. doesn't get healthier than this because all those other snacks have refined sugars, colours, preservatives and additives. Koro's snacks have none of that. I oh, can't wait. So I'm going to go for the bio energy ball today. Ooh, me. Salty pistachio. I've got a little uh, chocolate bar here, I think. Oh, the coconut chocolate bar. Mmm. Nice. Mm. Oh, that's good. Want to try it? Ooh. <laughs> so what makes Coro special in comparison to others? Coro avoids using sulfur, refined sugars, preservatives, colours and other additives. For a 5% discount on Coro's products, use the code TRUECRIME with no space in between true and crime. The link to Coro's online shop is in the description box on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. And my stepdad used to go on the toilet after he'd used, like if he didn't get the straight away drop, he'd go and sit on the toilet and then he'd drop. Um, and the, we only had one toilet, um, which is quite common. <laughs> um, and I, that bathroom would be out of action for three, four hours. Um, and I used to be so burst in for a wee that I now do 
uh, you know, I'd, I'd have to hold it. I couldn't go in. My mum was too scared to open the door or see what he was like. She wouldn't have a clue or she was off her face, passed down her bedroom. So um, I got into the stage of wetting myself quite a lot. Um, and like not wet in the bed. Um, I was quite lucky. I never really did that. I remember once I did it and they punished me really bad for it. Um, I was like, it's your fault. But um, yeah, even now in my adulthood, it's something I really struggle with, um, which I am really embarrassed about, you know, being a young 20 something year old, having one of the weakest bladders. Um, I remember once I was on a work call and I needed a wee so bad that I just weed on you know no well, luckily it was on a call but um you know some of my like if I go out for a day with my partner say if we go to London I have to plan my toilet breaks because otherwise I will wee myself um and you know I've done a lot of therapy and so forth and had a lot and there's nothing physically wrong with my bladder you know I've had all the tests and I think it is that mental state and I need to retrain my brain and you know I'm trying to but it's almost like where I couldn't go I think my brain tells me that I just need to wee because I'm not going to be able to make it to the toilet anymore I I don't really know how it all works but you know there's therapists and so forth for that um so that was sort of one of the things that was going on at home which my school didn't know um and once my stepdad punched me in the head and I remember he lined up his fist like that he lined it up I can't remember what I did I think I answered the phone or something and he wanted to use it and I was doing my makeup in, in my mirror in my bedroom so I wanted to go meet my mate and he'd come up to me and he went like this like this and he lined it up and then he went like that so and he punched me on the side of the head and I told my mum and she turned around and said you'd be knocked out if he punched you no he didn't <laughs> That's generally what she said. And I remember I went and met my mates after and told them. And they couldn't believe it, you know. But they didn't, they were kids, they didn't know what to do about it. Um, nothing recorded it or anything. Um, and that just really angered me. And I was like, I know he punched me. Obviously, he didn't punch me, you know, like that. Because like, he, he would have knocked me out. But he, he, he literally, the intent to line it up and then do it. It was just like a big bang in the side of the head. And I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm done with this. And he he poked me loads and I had all these bruises all here. So the next day I went into school and I showed them, you know, I went, look, my stepdad is hitting me. I don't know what to do. And they called my mum in. Obviously she turns up in her nice car, her pet hobs clothing, just come out of a meeting. And she goes, oh, no, she's lying. She does this all the time. The school believer put me in a drug rehabilitation class where they get an external party to come in and lecture me. I had to go once a week and they tell me how weed is a gateway drug, how many calories are in alcohol. So I could, t I could tell you that even though I don't drink. Um, and why yeah, I got this book about a heroin addict who died. And I had to sit there and just play, you know, ignorance. I just, you know, they tell me how I end up doing heroin and died. I just sit there like, I know more about heroin than you, you know, but I didn't say anything. Um, and I always thought that care would be worse. You know, I knew I had my sister at home. I had my friends. I liked my friends. Home was manageable. I think when you're in a situation it's really easy for people to think that all of it's bad and not every day is the worst day of your life like some days nothing happened you know so I felt that it was bearable I remember when I was older I told one of my friends they're like you need to move out and they didn't understand that not every day was hell you know some days I'd go home and nothing happened at all and it was quite mundane or some days it would be you know, if my stepdad would come home and he just start on me, you know, it, it, I think people always think when you're in a situation like that, every day is, you know, he didn't beat me every day, you know, it wasn't like that at all. Um, and I'm sure it is for some people, but I'm lucky enough to say I wasn't. Um, and I did call Childline as well once. And um, they just said, you know, tell your dad. And I did. 
and he did nothing. He didn't believe me. He said he called my mum and had to go. And again, my mum um, put on the waterworks, said, you know, that she's really concerned about me and I've been making up lies to the school and the school are worried about me. Uh, so I was and like, your dad you didn't believe you at all. No, I know. Um, he feels really guilty about it now, but I think it was easier for him at the time because then he would have actually had to do something about it. I'm not, I can't imagine being in that situation, you know. Um, I would like to think I would handle things differently, but you know, he had a difficult upbringing. He, I'm not trying to make excuses for him, but. I don't, he's not a bad person. I just don't think he knew, you know, there's not a textbook on how to deal with this. If there was, it would definitely not be how he dealt with it. Um, and uh, I always say to my, I always say about my dad, he's the fun uncle. So I go and see him every other weekend. He's a bit pissed. Like we have a laugh, we have a joke, but that's it. He doesn't know me. Like I've never ate fish. Um, funnily enough, it's ever since finding Nemo, you know, fish are friends. Oh, yeah, of course. I would never <laughs> eat fish after then, and I just can't. It's not even one of my favourite films. And, you know, I remember last year my dad got me, like, we went out for a meal and he ordered salmon or something. And even my partner was like, surely your dad knows you've never, ever ate fish. And I was like, you'd think, you'd think, you know, your dad knows that about you at least, you know? And his wife, she hated kids. And we were we were about eight when she met she met he met her. I remember just going around, she lived in a flat and there was a spare bedroom, but instead they used it as a bar and we'd have these sofa beds they put up, you know, and it's not like it wasn't like our second home. We went around every other weekend and we'd take things and we weren't allowed to leave anything or, you know, it wasn't our bedroom or anything. And we couldn't just help ourselves to the fridge. We'd have to say, can we have a drink, please? Um, but it was quite nice. So he had a working shower and the house was clean. So it was like a little vacation for us and we'd get to go and see my nan. Um, but, you know, my my step mum would always be like to us, God, I hate children. <laughs> my, they're like, thanks. <laughs> That's her. Cheers. Yeah, how awkward. <laughs> Yeah, so my so we had issues there, um, but she, she wasn't a horrible person. She just didn't want to be a step parent and she was. Um, so even now, like when they get Christmas cards, it's like to them too. It's not, you know, like say like my partner, his parents, I'm even in the Christmas card for friends. It's, you know, dear ex and family or dear all of us, you know, it's not just them. Whereas if my dad got a Christmas card, it would just be just him and his wife. You know, it, I, it's, I reckon, and I say this all the time to my partner, they like going on holidays and like, they've even been to see like David Guetta and stuff. They're, they're a little bit midlife crisis. Um, and I reckon if somebody said to them, do you guys have kids? They'd say no. That sort of, wow. yeah. I feel like my, like my dad would say no. Like uh, that's just how, he might not. But none of his mates know us or anything. He's, yeah, he's not really there. So, um, and my mum used to always exploit that. She'd almost be like, well, at least I care. At least I look after you day to day. And she'd be quite manipulative at that because my dad wasn't really given the opportunity, nor did he, you know, help himself in that. Um, but my dad feels a lot of guilt now and he always gets drunk and he'll bring me every so often and be really sad. Um and then I got put on early study leave from school because I missed a Saturday detention <laughs> for wearing my coat inside. I had a real big issue with authority um, and I still struggle with it. So, you know, the whole ex respect your elders, all of that, because the elders in my house, I didn't respect them. So I found it really hard then. You know, at school, it's all about sir miss mad you know sort of giving that authority unless they unless they earn my respect they wouldn't get it whereas at school you have to just give teachers respect so I remember once um you know a teacher told me to take my coat off and I was like but you've got yours on like you know what what you want me to be cold but you're all right and I just didn't have that respect that most kids would just be like look this person in in a, 
in their role has told you to take off your coat to take off your coat I, I didn't see life like that I was a rebel I I pushed back on everything you know I'd smoke in the bathrooms and if people would question me on it I'd push back and just I was just horrible you know it was absolutely horrible um I, was, I didn't respect them and I got put on, a, I think they wanted to put me on early study leave anyway. Um, so me missing that Saturday detention was like, bingo, we'll, we'll say it's for that. Um, so obviously then I was like off all summer with nothing to do. And, you know, I got more into drugs and more with drug dealers. And I, I never, I never did anything like heroin or crack or anything like that. Um, what was your first drug of choice? mine was weed <laughs> mine was weed the but gateway. I, yeah the gateway uh, uh it got to the stage where i'd wake up and have a spliff in the morning i wouldn't be able to fun you know it wasn't a rolly in the morning it was a spliff and my mum would just let me smoke in the garden you know it wasn't like i had to hide it from her like she used to drop me off at school and i used to meet my friends at the shop and she'd give me a cigarette to go and meet them with this when i was like 13 14 you know it wasn't like she tried to stop me she just wanted an easy life I remember one of my exams I missed because she let me well I I stayed out till three in the morning and the next day she tried to wake me up and I was like I'm not getting up and because she wanted an easy life you know she was like okay so she just let me miss my exam you know not like other parents that would be like no get your ass up you know and how dare you be out till 3 a.m when you got an exam the next day my, if i was out of the house my mum would love it you know she didn't have to worry about hiding the drugs or anything and you know she loved it she loved me being out and i think about some of the situations i got myself in and I, she used to let me walk well, that night no it was another night i come home at two in the morning and this car stopped by me and they let off a bang and I thought it was a gun. It probably was, I don't know what it was, but I generally thought in that moment I was getting kidnapped. And I went home and told my mum, she wasn't, she was like, well, you should come home earlier then. Not like, <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. Another, another night I went to a party in a village and they dropped me in town. I got the bus there. And then my friend got paralytic and went home and she was the only one I knew. So I rang my parents and was like, look, I don't know anyone at this party. Can you please pick me up? I know I said I was going to stay at her house, but she's literally got paralytic. And I'm like, no. Hey. You've got your yeah, my friend got so, yeah. paralytic. Yeah, so I I couldn't stay at her house. And her dad went mental. And, um, yeah, so I, I needed a lift home. And obviously yeah, anybody's going to think their parents are going to pick them up if, if they're in that situation. Um, and they didn't they wanted to teach me a lesson about not going out and you know not having a way home when i did i was supposed to be staying with my friends um but you know situations changed um and i just remember being at this so it was this guy's party but his older brother was also having the party so i was like 14 15 and those are like 25 year olds there um, and a lot of the younger ones, sort of people my age, had already gone home by now, you know. Um, and I had nowhere else to stay, so I had to stay at the party. And I went up to bed, and I remember the next day there was this picture circulating, like, around about with this 24-year-old who was spooning me. There was, like, a photo of us two in bed together. Oh, like, I was fully dressed and everything, but how horrible is that? <laughs> so, so you passed out at the party and someone got into bed and started spooning you? yeah. And there was a photo of it, like somebody thought, like, yeah. It, oh, it honestly makes me so gross. And I, I know it's my, it's I know it's my fault for getting that situation, but I really hate my parents for it. Like, why didn't they just come and pick me up? Like, I was really in danger at that party. I'd just like to say it's not not your fault. Obviously, the person taking the photo is clearly disturbed. <laughs> yeah. I think they were my age as well, um, to be honest. But the per yeah, the person I remember like everyone was going, Oh, so what happened with you and this guy? I was like, he's twenty four, like nothing. And then they showed me, I was like, I was asleep. What is wrong with this? You know, he was full like cuddle it off. Oh, yeah, it makes me feel so sick. Um but yeah, so so like I say, I was put into a lot of dangerous positions, sometimes through my own fault, but you know, my parents weren't there to um rescue me so yeah my, my childhood was um i'm sure there's other sort of 
little bits and pieces in there. Um, but basically, I was heading down a wrong path, and that was when I met my partner. Um, he um, actually insta dm me, um, and we just got talking, and we've been together over eight years now, and he's the light of my life. So when I first met him, I like I said, I was having a spliff, I was smoking, I was drinking. Now I don't do any of that. Um, so I don't know, um, you know, if that's sort of my childhood. I don't know if you have any questions before we sort of go into how I've sort of turned it around or my research into it. Of course, um, your mum was upholding quite a middle class look, yeah. I guess, during her addictions. Did her friends suspect anything? She didn't have any. She didn't have any, no. No, she didn't no. have it. She get, so like at work, you wouldn't have known. She was, you know, she had that profession from, and then outside of work, she didn't socialise with anyone. She didn't see anyone, you know, she a weekend she'd just be in um but you know uh, I've told someone who doesn't know my mum and they didn't believe her you know it is if you met my mum you would be and I think when we think of high function addict we think of you know the rich bankers or the lawyers who were sat in a penthouse in London snorting cocaine with prostitutes or on the flip side, um, and I always quote Ed Sheeran's The A-Team in this. Um, I just remember, because I remember watching that video, you know, and she's doing cocaine or crack cocaine or, you know, um, and that song's all about how, you know, she's been a prostitute to, you know, fund her drug lifestyle. And that isn't my mum either. And there's she's this bit in the middle and not to commercialise it, but it's like a gap in the market, you know. Everybody thinks that you're either homeless or you know you're top of the pile doing you know a lot of people say you know politicians and everything do drugs and you know with all their money and so forth and I know a few people in London who my sister hangs around with and they have you know coke dependencies um you know and it's supposed to sort of you know it it just seems that people don't think there could be this middle like you said, the middle class, the middle ground, the people that aren't earning, you know, six figure salaries, the people that aren't, you know, driving luxury cars, the people that are, you'll see walking past you day to day, you know, I, it's, it's funny because my mum's really, she'll sometimes like, I'll hear, like, I used to hear her on a work call, she worked from home, and she'd be like, being like, oh my God, I can't believe this mother has done this. And I'm there like, pot kettle black, you know. Um, so I think it's it has made me look at people really differently and you never really know what's going on behind closed doors and I think everybody couldn't get past what we know and you know there were signs there I think for safeguarding with me um, you know the school could have done something but I think their own stereotypes and their own experiences stood in the way of them making any calls or anything because they couldn't compute so sort of what I hope my gift to the world is is to say you know and for me I really punished myself all these years I thought I don't have a right to feel like a victim because I wasn't homeless or I wasn't you know sexually assaulted and it's only until recently when my mental health took a turn and I'd be doing this therapy that sort of when I tell the stories to my therapist they look at me and like <laughs> I, I actually there's not a narcotics anonymous around me, which is like the, there's a group called Awanon, which um, like families and friends, alcoholics can go to. Um, and the narcotics anonymous would be, you know, her opioids equivalent, but there's not one near me. So I went, I rang the Awanon and was like, can I go? And they're like, yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Um, and generally that's when I started to realize that even though I was, I had the, a bit of a different experience the feelings and the shame and the guilt they were all the same between all of us and that's when you know people saying to me actually you you do have a right you weren't you didn't have a good childhood like I always felt that I couldn't ever moan or ever talk about it because I I should be lucky that I wasn't homeless or I wasn't put into care or anything and my mum always told me that and and my sister still reinforces that um and it's sort of, you know, just shut up, get down and 
carry on and what I want to do is stop this cycle of you know the abuser becoming the abused and I really really want to you know try and make this experience into something and I just remember coming home all the time from school and at school they always tell you to go on the talk to Frank website um I don't know if schools are paid to say that because we used to I remember like in sociology or whatever we'd always spend a like a lesson looking on there um and that's government funded and I I've been knocking on a few doors I've been emailing all different companies you know saying you know you've got nothing for children of addicts so it's always you know if you search heroin addict parents you can't find anything um it's all it just comes up the searches is if you're a parent whose child is a heroin addict um there's just not a lot out there um and yeah as you were saying about the stereotypes I, I remember when I was younger I I always thought heroin addicts were homeless yeah so so I, two, I would have never yeah yeah so the there there was a study done two-thirds of homeless people have cited that drug abuse is um contributed to them being homeless um so you know there are facts and but and you know I do almost break the the statistics a little bit but there is also other statistics that sort of back up you know where where I've been but in there isn't a lot of research in the UK around heroin um like there is on cocaine and so forth so in America every 25 minutes a child is born with an opioid addiction which is just staggering. And I've tried to look for every statistic that there is in the UK and it just seems to not really be spoken about. We have such a, it's almost like the Harry Potter Voldemort, you know, they shall not be named. Heroin is just one of them. You know, you can talk about anything, but when you talk about heroin, everyone's like, whoa, you know, mm. it, you just don't go there. And I found that really hard. It's such, you know, I used to always think, why can't she be an alcoholic you know why can't and and I'm not saying that that is any easier you know because you know I was lucky enough my mum didn't come home and really drunk and you know had her knickers around her ankles or anything like some stories I've read so you know there are I'm not saying one's better than the other at all um but you know as a kid I used to just be like I wish I could talk about it you know and uh, but with heroin you just can't um and this is something that I really struggle with is even when I was doing drugs, I don't think I could have got a hold of heroin. I, I probably could have in like a, a day, like if I really wanted to, but I, I'm always trying to think when my mum was holding me as a one year old, you know, it's not like you fall on a needle, <laughs> you know, it's not like with, I, I sort of get the pressure of alcohol if you know you can just drink too much because it's socially normal to have alcohol out but it's not socially normal to have heroin and you've got to really seek it and that's something that I really struggle with you know it's not like she had to actively seek that she knew what she was doing you know there, there's a lot of proof it's not just drinking it you know she has to burn the spoon and inject it to me that's something I do really struggle with and before we get on to your mental health and di diagnostics, how was your mental health, um, the internal state of it at the time of your mother's addiction? Terrible. Um, I was just really angry. I think I didn't realise how much it was affecting me until sort of I was out of the situation um so until I met my partner and I started living a normal life so my partner's had a really nice upbringing and his family like my family and I hated family and I even hated dogs I remember I went into his house the first time and he saw he showed me his dog and he was like oh this is my dog and I was like great don't care you know and now the dog is my dog you know I love dogs they're amazing and it's just the fact that I didn't have that family unit, like Christmas, I hated. Um, you know, it wasn't a, a time with family for me wasn't a good thing, whereas now I'm such a family person. You know, I can't wait for me and my partner to have kids one day. Um, and, but ever since we've like moved in together and so forth, that's when my mental health has sort of took a worst as well. Um, and like when I was in sick form, 
Um, I did want to go to university. Um, but I just, so basically my mum randomly just decided to book this holiday. When I, I was like in, with my boyfriend for like two years and I hadn't lived with her for two years. And she's quite erratic. Like she, she just buys herself tipping necklaces and stuff. She's very odd, um, very odd. Um, and she just booked this holiday to Egypt. And Egypt isn't, you know, I, I wouldn't mind going to Egypt with my partner, but three women, you know, me, my mum and my sister are all like five foot. Um, it's probably, you know, we're all quite shy as well. It, it, I didn't feel safe. Um, and it was a horrible holiday. I didn't want to go in the first place. And that might sound really spoiled, but I hadn't been on holiday with my mum since I was, what, five when we went to Florida. So now when I'm 18 going, when I haven't been with her in years, um, you know, it just felt, she didn't even ask me, you know, she didn't say, do you want to go? She just booked it. I was in the middle of my A-levels and it was just the worst holiday ever. And I feel really selfish saying that, but it all started. I remember being on the plane there and I was reading Alexander McQueen's um, biography because um, I wanted to do, I was doing fashion at that point. I um, wanted to be a fashion designer, don't we all? Um, and I remember reading about his mental health because obviously he committed suicide and I couldn't read it. It, it was really triggering something like, and I was like, why can't I read this? And I just put the book away and I thought, maybe I just don't like the book. And that whole holiday, I cried every day and I hated it. And Is that because you were having suicidal thoughts that you have in the past? I think it was being forced to be with my mum. And I realised how dysfunctional our relationship was. I couldn't even spend a week abroad with her. I didn't feel safe with her. I hated it. I was like, I generally if I had money I would have paid for a flight home like I hated it I wanted to be with my partner I didn't feel safe my mum was having horrible withdrawals I was scared at the airport thinking is she gonna try smuggle heroin in like what's she gonna do you know um, it was horrible it was absolutely horrible so when we got back I just felt numb to everything and I just kept crying I went back to sick form was crying and they would send me home and they eventually told me I missed too much and that I'd have to, you know, drop out. So I was like a drop out with nothing to do, not knowing what's wrong with me. Um, my partner was really supportive. Um, and I, you know, the doctors were like, oh, yeah, you're depressed. And I was like, I don't think I am. I, like, I generally don't think I am. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I Yeah, so I was happy with my life with my partner. Um, and... I just knew that I wasn't, and I did psychology at A-level, and I remember reaching out to my psychology um, teacher who was at my school, and I said about my symptoms, she's like, that sounds like OCD, you know, your intrusive thoughts, um, you know, your rituals, all of that. And I went back to the doctor and I said, look, do you think it could be this? And they're like, oh yeah, it is. I was like. We hope you enjoyed the podcast, this is a word from our sponsor. Jen, it's that time of the year when people are stuffing themselves with food and the sun's not out and vitamin deficiencies occur. You said that you were on some vitamins, but you were overdosing yourself. I honestly was taking up to 10 tablets a day, not knowing if they were giving me any health benefits at all. So now finding Vital has proved absolute wonders for me. Fill in a short online consultation about your diet, health goals and lifestyle and Vital will create a tailored made pack just for you. To get a free two week trial of personalized vitamins, head to vitl.com and use the code Sean, S-H-A-U-N at checkout. Link is in the description box below this video. So Jen, how easy is the Vital website to use? So with a few simple steps, it can tell you what you are lacking in nutrients. So for me, it was my skin, sleep and stress. <laughs> so mm. now after four days of use, I'm already seeing an improvement. So well done, Vital. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Now back to the podcast. Great. Okay. And before I got diagnosed, I remember at one point I was suicidal. And the only reason I didn't commit suicide is because I didn't want to leave my partner on his own. I remember sitting in a doctor's room and telling this doctor that if they let me go, I'm going to kill myself. And they let me go. They said, there's nothing we can do. We put you on the waiting list for counselling. There's nothing more we could do. And 
you know, luckily for them, I didn't kill myself <laughs> um, because I, I just couldn't leave my partner. I, I just couldn't think about this space finding me. Um, you know, that was a reason at the time I didn't do it. And I'm glad I didn't do it. Um, but it was, you know, if I was really upset, I'd think it's okay. I can kill myself. I can get out of this. You know, if I was ever feeling really low, you know, I, there's an escape. Um, and then I got put on medication for my OCD and it, it did get better. I was in and out of jobs. I couldn't find anything I really liked. And I just thought it was me that there was something wrong with. Um, and then I got a job, did really well at it, got another job, did really well at that. And now I've got a really good career for my age. You know, a lot of people say to me, wow, you, you know, you've done so well for someone who hasn't gone to university. But I don't think what people understand is I'm running away. I don't want to be anything like my mum. And that's why, you know, I'm trying so hard and I don't want to be a failure and um, although it looks good from the outside, you know, I put so much pressure on myself. It's like with my house, it has to be a certain way. Um, I'm really funny about my weight. I constantly have really horrible controlling thoughts. I think where I couldn't control my mum and her addiction or, you know, how she was, I try and control everything else. Um, and it is really horrible. And I had another turn at the start of the year. Um, my partner and I had some work doing at our house and I don't know what it was I don't know if it was just the reality of owning a house and having it taken away or something or just the fear of losing it but that's when it all come out about my childhood and I started remembering things and again I went to the NHS and they weren't great <laughs> um, they are very under-resourced um, but with mental health you know they're like there's a six-month waiting list um, so I started paying. I was lucky enough to be able to pay for private therapy and it's done me the world of good. Um, and I'm working through it now and I've gone, you know, to move forward, you need to go back sometimes. And I've gone back and remembered a lot from my childhood and done a lot of work, you know, and distanced myself from my mum a little bit more. And she did actually go to rehab early in the year. Um, so I wasn't talking to my mum. I said, I need some a break from you. So she decided to go to rehab. Um, and this sounds very crude, but I generally think she only did that to shut me up. And my sister thinks that too. Uh, like when she was in rehab, she's like, yeah, you can talk to me again. It's like, oh, you know, hold on. It doesn't quite work like that. Um, anyway, her rehab didn't work. She didn't stay there for very long, as long as she was supposed to. Um I rang her counsellor and she's like, yeah, she hasn't been turning any of my calls. She did admit to me that she relapsed. Um, and um, so where we are today really is she's a compulsive liar who tells me she wants to quit and cries and so forth, but she doesn't. And I'm just trying to manage our relationship and she puts back on me that I should, you know, be there for her and stuff. And yeah, I, uh, that's sort of where my life is at the moment um so I'm still in therapy I'm still trying to work out I'm really angry about my situation but I feel like it has to be for something so I feel like my gift to the world is to share my story and try and um you know raise awareness about heroin and child of addicts and the fact that there isn't enough support out there for them no. And how do you think they can supply more support to children of drug addicts? So I definitely think so. When we were talking earlier, I don't think I quite touched on it when I said about talk to Frank. So there's three options on their website. So if you go on heroin or something, there's worried about dot, 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 your friend, pressure taking drugs, your child. There's nothing on there. Or what about if you're a child, even on the government website, um, on the safeguarding policy for you know, Children's Act and all of that, there's no guidance around what will actually, because for me, I never knew, I was like, I don't want to send my mum to jail, because obviously, you know, you go and talk to Frank, and it's like, heroin is a class A drug, you'll go to jail, you know, and that's really scaremongering, I, I get it, but for a child, when I was reading that, I was like, God, I can't tell anyone, so don't my mum to go to jail, um, so I just think some better guidance around what really happens with kids of addicts um because nobody really knows i even spoke to social workers and they're like well it depends they, there's a risk assessment not every child of an addict gets taken away sometimes they get monitored 
you know there's just it's just such a taboo um and i think we could do better at educating around different types of drugs you know that not you don't have to fall into a stereotype i think we focus far too much in drug prevention when actually it's probably in already in a lot of people's lives um you know it's when i was 15 they're telling me not to do drugs and i'm going i've I've seen drugs all my life what do i do now you know how do you change that cycle how do you break away instead of just falling down this norm um because there has been a lot of research done um i know the american psych it's the apa it's called and they found that you know over a half of people that do drugs have had drug use in, in their family. Um, so I think is we need to, why are people doing the drugs? You know, generally it's probably because they've been exposed to it from a young age. How can we change that? How can we improve safeguarding? How can we stop? I, I always felt, you know, everybody was like to me, oh, you're going to do heroin and die. It's, you know, what about what I've experienced nobody asks a child what their experience was and they don't give them that freedom and I think everybody always ripped me off and nobody believed me um and it's just giving everybody that voice um and I think with mental health so much more could be done I know it's really difficult um I know CAMS was not a good experience for me child and adolescent mental health services I had one session and I told them about my mum and they basically were like, yeah, you've done my work for me and basically said, you know, that's why you're sad and you'll get over it, basically. Um, I know every counsellor isn't the same, um, but they are really under-resourced. Um, I did actually reach out to Mind um, with my story and they replied and basically said that, you know, there's so much that they need to look at. This just isn't a priority at the moment. Um which I completely get, but that's the thing. It's just not a priority for anyone, but so many people struggle with it. And it's, you know, we could really help so many children by just getting this conversation out there. And because there is so many addicts um, and they they think, you know, there is research about 60% of heroin addicts aren't even identified. So you think all of them, they probably have kids as well. Um, so yeah i mean uh, if i had a magic wand i would go into schools and really just create a safe space what what i would like to do is create like a confidential channel where children could come and ask questions to professionals because i think that was something that you know i was really worried about getting contaminated by the needles like if i touched the bin where the methadone had done would i then get high you know as a kid you think like that and i almost wish i had i was able to ask a doctor or something that's sort of what I'd like to do, just to, I think the more you know about something, then you can make an informed decision on it. I just think that we're all too ignorant around drugs and children and so forth. And a lot of people say to me, oh, but, you know, it's made you stronger. Uh, but I was a child. I didn't need to be strong. I needed to be loved, you know, and I, I want to change that narrative as well. Of, Well, you've done a right for yourself. Ignore that. Let's just focus on the young me yeah I mean to me it seems you've really truly broken the mold from your mother's um, upbringing obviously Mm -hmm. and I mean do you ever see yourself building a future with your mother a, a proper solid relationship with her clean no and this is what I feel really guilty about um and I've I've um I've had a lot of discussions with my therapist and she said quite a lot of people don't wish their parents dead, but they sort of wish that they could grieve for them almost. Like if, if they're going to do these drugs and die, they sort of like, are like, why don't they just do it? And sometimes I feel like that. My mum, like I've, I don't want her to overdose at all, but I used to come home and be like, is today the day that I'm going to find her? And I know one day I'm going to find her dead um, because heroin addicts so over that's just what they do and the word overdose is a bit contradicting because it it, it's not they know what levels to do it can just be that it's a bad batch or something so it's not so much that they overdose you know that they can just get 
um, a bad batch. Um, and that could happen to my mum at any day. And I know I'm going to be the person to find her one day. Um, so sometimes I feel like I just want to get that over and done with. And I lay at night thinking about it, about how I'm going to get her affairs in order, how I'm going to tell people that because I don't want to ruin her reputation. She'd be horrified if I told anyone that was the reason she died. So I'm already think I'm already thinking how I can mitigate against that and what I'm going to say the cause of death was and everything like that. Um, yeah, I, that in my opinion, she spent more than half her life on drugs. Obviously, she had the chance to get free of it when she was younger, and she hasn't. And I personally think that she likes the drugs. I, I think she does like them. And I know there's people on drugs that absolutely hate it and do want to get off, but I don't think my mum is one of them. Yeah, it is very unfortunate. I, I can't, in an, in the nicest possible way, I don't know. I, I don't know if she'd enjoy, like, she'd enjoy life without it. I think that is generally, like, the love of her life. But it is part of addiction. Unfortunately, the drugs become the one and one only one focus yeah. for them. Yeah. But. And that's the thing. I've never been – so, like, I don't drink because so I'm too scared to get addicted to it. And I don't – you know, I, because I don't want to turn out like my mum. It's completely irrational. Um, but I just don't like – do like, I won't even buy a scratch card or pay the lottery because I'm like, what if I get addicted to it? You know, I, I – it does still affect my day to day and everything, you know, because I just want to do when, when people say to me, Oh, you look like your mum or something. It's the worst thing anybody can ever say. I mean, do you believe in the theory of addictive personalities can are hereditary? Um, yeah, I, th I think there's quite a, from the research I've read, I think there, there is quite a lot to support it. Um, I just, yeah um i don't really know I'd, I'd quite like to do more research on it before sort of giving a solid answer but i i do think generally you know my my nan was addicted to valium and then my mum become addicted and she's addicted to smoking and, and my mum's addicted to anything like she get like she was addicted to twixes you know she she's very she does have an addictive personality um and part of me is like, I don't even want to risk it. It might not be, but also, what if it is? <laughs> um, and, you know, I can live without drinking. I also don't like the thought of not being in control of myself. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a few different sort of explanations to that. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, it is difficult. I, I generally don't think there's enough research put into how it all works. I have been reading this book um which i've only just sort of started reading books there's a really good one by dr julie um called no why did nobody tell me this before that's really helped um and there's another one um can't think of the name of it but it's talking all about how they did research and like granddaughters and grandchildren of holocaust survivors have like shared trauma dna that trauma can be passed on you know in the womb um and sort of low you know um i think it's cortisol levels and so forth it's, it's really interesting so part of me is like god should i not have children either um you know i know you can go to therapy and work on it but i really hate how much it's took from me and how much it still affects my everyday life mm. Oh, well, before we finish up today, and um, thank you for coming on today. Have you got any messages out there for any children or adults who are currently going through or gone through addiction, addiction parents, family members? No yeah, self? so um, uh, sort of a few messages. Um, like for parents, if you, if you are doing drugs, um, you know, and you do have children, they don't hate you. They don't blame you. They just want, you know, like why I hate my stepdad is because he hit my mum, not because he hit me. That's what I, you know, remember. They, they're not there to judge you. So please just, you know, and they do know more. And the children, um, there's a really good thing on our anon and it's called the three C's. It's I did not cause it. I cannot control it. Um, 
and um, I cannot control it. Oh, I, I cannot cure it. I cannot control it, and I did not cause it. Um, and that really helped me because I still feel like I am to blame, but you're not. Um, at the end of the day, addiction cripples all people, um, and it's not their fault either. You know, addiction is a disease. And I just hope that you get the help you need and you don't need to carry on the cycle. And you can always email me, Penelope Red Educate at gmail.com um, and look on my Instagram at Penelope Red Trust where I'm just sharing my stories and quotes and um, things I've learned. I'd also recommend to go and watch Joe Wicks's um, documentary on BBC where he talks about his um, dad's heroin addiction too. Um, so there are slowly things starting to come out. Um, yeah. And we'll around. put all of your links in the description box below this video so everyone can get hold of you, send you messages. And e uh, do you have an email address as well? Yeah, I said that you yeah. read educate at gmail. Yeah. Perfect. We'll put that all below. So get in contact if you have mm -hmm. any questions for Penelope or, I mean, are you happy to give advice to people going through something um, similar? Yeah, obviously, I'd like to say I'm not a professional um, and, you know, all of a lot of the things that I say have come from my therapist um, in terms of, um, you know, coping with OCD and anxiety. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I'm not a professional. There are a lot of helplines as well, um, like MIND. There's um, NACO, National Association of Children of um, Alcoholics, but they are also there. I've, I've only just found these. There's the Samaritans. There is a lot out there, Childline, SPCC, um, so, you know, if you ever are there, please do use one of them. Um, and, you know, I'm always here. And they are wonderful charities. I'll put them in the uh, description box below this video as well. So what do you plan now we're finishing up for uh, New Year's? I am going, yeah, I'm going to um, go out and just party the way into... Um, Whenever I go out, obviously I don't drink, so I'm always there drinking tea. I, it's so hard when you go out. Nowhere sells tea after nine o'clock. You know, you, you go to a bar and, no. like, and they look at you like you're asking, you know, for them to wash your feet. I think it's, my partner does say, imagine you walking around, though, with the hot drink when people are drunk around you. You know, it's probably a health and safety concern. But, yeah. you know. Good point. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> 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 Being drunk no. is not safety concern than my tea um how about you <laughs> oh a quiet one for me i don't drink either so it's yeah busy nightclubs oh, that was my 20s I'm I'm the to be like can we just order a curry and watch it oh, it's great isn't it i'm i'm i think i'm solar powered so i only like the summer to be out late as soon as it like it's winter i'm not interested i go into hibernation mode so <laughs> I, I there's warm jumpers all the way heavy yeah. socks but well, thank, no, well thank well thank you for coming on honestly you are a brilliant speaker and i've really jo enjoyed today's chat you're yeah, i mean what i've been through and <laughs> hidden in plain sight i want to say yeah, that's a that's a really good um saying. I might steal that. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> but no. you know, giving me this platform and all the great work you do, and um, you know, because yeah, you contacted me via Instagram, which is yeah, you know, for, kudos to you just going sh straight for the juggernaut and saying, look, I've got a story. Um, I really want to get it out, and rightly so. And I've if anyone else so wants to get in contact, I actually have a letter from Kensington Palace. I emailed, I know really? Kensington does a lot of work. Oh, sorry, Princess of Wales, I think I have to call it now. Um, she um, did a lot of, she does a lot of work with children. And I sent a letter to her office when she was Duchess Cambridge. This was like a week before the Queen died. I got the reply. It was really odd. Um, I had the letter, it's like official Kensington Palace. She didn't sign it, but she said that, you know, her secretary said the Duchess of Cambridge wishes you. Oh, well, but she signposted me to some charities. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to do like an event. Um, and actually, one other thing I want to say is um, women's aid is for children too. Um, their slogan is actually until women and children are safe. And I've been in contact with them and they're absolutely amazing too. So that's another chat. There, there are, I didn't realise how many good charities there are out there. Um, so yeah, just thank you for giving me this platform and 
Happy New Year. Oh, thank you. And Happy New Year. And yes, um, if anyone's got any questions, if you can stick them in the comment box below this video, like and subscribe. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for tuning in. See you later. Bye. This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press. We are proud to announce the publication of The Girl Gambler, a young woman's story of her escape from gambling addiction. The story of a young girl's entrapment in gambling addiction, the true advert for problem gambling and how it controlled her every movement, every thought and almost took her life. How the guilt and shame that go hand in hand with addiction stopped her from reaching out for help for eight years as she didn't feel it was okay for a young female to be a problem gambler. How she believed it was a male dominated problem and how eventually she did find the tools that enabled her to become free of her addiction. Available worldwide on Amazon, link in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor.